Let's open our Bibles to the end, to the book of Revelation. We're in our second week going through Revelation 4 and 5. And this morning, there's one truth I'd love you to hold on to. Um, The Lord himself desires that every day we orient our life to the reality that towering over us, uh, immensely overshadowing everything in this world and in our life is the throne of our God in heaven. And what he wants us to know is that it's not just like the Washington Monument that sits there, you know, doing nothing, that God himself sits on that throne and that he orchestrates to accomplish his purpose and to fulfill his word. Everything that happens in our life in this world. There is nothing, when we'll see next week, not even the hopping of the sparrow along the ground, not even the number of the hair of each of our heads that escapes his consideration. And he says, I want you to orient yourself to that every day. And I want you to live under the shadow of the throne. So that's, that's the concept of Revelation 4 and 5. And we must not let the rest of our life distract us from this foundational truth that heaven is real, in the center of heaven is that throne, and sitting on that throne is our king. Because we're in his kingdom, we're his servants. And that foundational truth embraces every part of our life. Well, as we open to Revelation chapter 4, look at verses 2 and 3. We're going to read them in a moment. But not only is the throne central, but the spotlight goes to the one seated on the throne. And every moment of our life is lived before the eyes of the one seated on the throne. And no event in our life is missed by the one who is seated on that throne. And that's the message of the next sentence of this letter. Uh, You know, the Greek language, though we have verses, is written in sentences, and verses two and three are, are one complete sentence that were written by God to us. And that's a message that he wants us to orient our lives to. So let's all stand together. We're going to read our scripture from the screen, and you can just follow along there and and, and notice the emphasis of the one that's seated on that throne together. Immediately, I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Amazing. Let's bow before him in prayer. Father, as you are seated right now on the throne, our prayers rise before you. In the next chapter, we'll see that you collect every one of them. Every prayer we offer you collect. And we see in chapter 8, you pour them out. And even some of those unanswered prayers that have been waiting, some of them for thousands of years, you finally, at your perfect time, pour them out in your will being done. And I pray that today you'd open our hearts to the reality that you are the one sitting on the throne and that we would understand what goes on before your throne and how actively you're engaged in accomplishing your purpose and will in our lives. Teach us that, but teach us to transform us, not to just inform us, but to transform and conform us to Christ's likeness. And we'll ask that and expect that by your grace. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, The throne is central to heaven, but even more central to heaven is the one seated on that throne. And that's that's what we're going to focus upon is what exactly is going on as God sits on that throne. And how does that have any influence on life in the 21st century? Because for most of us, there's a little detachment between the scene in heaven and now and between even the Old Testament and now in the book of Revelation. And it's just like they're all little pieces floating. And this morning we're going to knit them together because every event in this world, every birth, 
Every death, every disaster, all the wars, you know, what's going on in Syria, what went on in Libya, what is coming, wherever, every social event, I mean, the, the big funeral in New Jersey, I mean, everything going on in this world, even all the secret ones, are in front of the eyes of the one sitting on the throne. He sees in secret, he hears every word, nothing escapes him. That's, that's the boggling scene that Revelation 4 reveals. Nothing is missed by the one seated on the throne. And what, what God wants us to do is to use that, that concept as kind of like the viewfinder. You know how in the old you know, cameras you used to look through the hole, now you look at the screen. It's the frame. God on the throne is the frame around everything that happens in life. And, and we are the ones that are supposed to know that as, because we're connected to him. So God says, I want you to have a lens, a frame that you look at your life and everything going on in the world and understand it through that frame. And that frame is that I am seated on the throne and nothing is escaping my attention. It's an overwhelming thought. In, in fact, to understand that, let's, let's go back to 1 Kings in your Bibles. 1 Kings um, chapter 22. Because in 1 Kings 22, and, and when you get there, get to verse 18, we come to the very first time we see God explicitly throwing, uh, showing us an event through the frame. Now, it's happening all the time, but this is the first time in the whole Bible we see God showing us an event in real time and how it, it coincides and syncs with what's going on in front of the throne. And for most of us, we don't even realize that, that this is going on, that there's this correspondence. But as we turn to 1 Kings 22, we're seeking to learn more than just information, how we can hear from the one seated on the throne. You know, it's kind of like uh, they, they have these spotters, you know, people that are, are, are they're telling you what's coming, and, and you can see. See, we, we have a spotter. We have God on the throne. How can we hear from him, what we're seeing through the frame. How can we interpret it? See, that's what we're looking at as we look at, at this passage. But on your way to the book of First Kings, I wonder how many of you know where First Kings is? I mean, uh, how easy is it to find such obscure passages in the Bible? Because if we're going to hear God... The Bible is our digital device that connects us to the voice of God. I mean, literally, uh, this would be better understood like this. This is the way I hear what God is doing. This is the ultimate flat screen media device. This, God's Word, is how I hear and see what He is doing in my life and in the world and understand it and, and, and make sense of it. This is his broadcasting to us. The Bible is the programming stream from the God of heaven. And God's words only come on one channel. You, you understand that there's only one avenue. And he speaks into our lives through his word while we're on earth. So a quick question as we explore Obscure First Kings. How well do you know this communication device, the Bible, that we have? Do you know your computer or phone better? You know, I meet people, and they will work until they figure out every program, every button, every right click, left click. Uh, do you know your media system at home better than this? Do you know the programming guide so you don't miss anything on cable, you know, everything better than this? See, that's why most people don't understand life, because they don't understand the frame. They don't look through the lens, the viewfinder. They aren't listening and hearing God explain through his word. And so... 
The reason why so many people today treasure their electronic world is because they force themselves to understand and use it. They've invested whatever time it takes to capture their ideas, their photos, their events, their words, and basically their whole life. And then they go beyond that and they learn how to send it out into an online place so that they can go back and look at it and re-enjoy it and share it and communicate through it. And in a very real sense, that's just mirroring what God has done, only he's already downloaded it all. And he's asking us to figure out how to get in and understand what he's doing. Because as we're going to see in, in this passage, is that God, his, the way he works is this. He has decided, Jeremiah 1.12 says, that he is going to watch over everything written in this book and he is going to perform, that's the word, I'm watching over my word to perform it. And if you want to understand what's going on in your own life and the world around you, understand what he has said. And all of a sudden, it puts a framework around everything going on in this world. And the book we hold in our hands contains the only way to be able to personally hear the voice of God speaking into our hearts and lives. So, now, 1 Kings 22. If we're going to hear from him by reading his word, second thought, how do we, what, what do we learn from this one sitting on the throne? What is he doing up there? What, what is the throne even have to do with life? Well, uh, and the king of Israel, I'm starting verse 18, I'm going to read real fast. Um, and the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, did I not tell you he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? Now, what, we've just jumped in the middle. We've jumped into the pond in the middle. It's King Ahab is the king of Israel, and Jehoshaphat is the king of Judah. And Ahab says, so oh, don't listen to the prophet Micaiah. He always says bad stuff because he's always gloom and doom because he represents God. So that's the context. Then Micaiah, he's the true genuine prophet of the Lord, verse 19 of 1 Kings 22, then Micaiah said, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne. Now look up for a minute. That's where we just were in Revelation 4. Same throne, same Lord. And this is the very first time in the Bible that we find a reverence to God sitting on his throne. And so it's just, I mean, I'm not talking about chronologically, I'm talking about in the order of the book. So this is the first one. And look what it says. So the Lord is sitting on his throne in the middle of verse 19, and all the hosts of heaven standing by on his right hand and on his left. And verse 20 says, and the Lord said, do you catch what's going on here? God is sitting on the throne. It says, all the hosts of heaven are arrayed in front of him. And the Lord speaks from his throne. Who, the Lord says, who will persuade Ahab to go up that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead? So one spoke in this manner, another spoke in that manner. So there's talking among the hosts of heaven. Verse 21, then a spirit came forward. I mean, it's kind of like they're nudging each other. I mean, if spirits can nudge each other, and they're discussing this. And finally, one comes before the awesome majesty on high, and it's a demon. I mean, look what it says. And one came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I'll persuade him. And the Lord said to him, in what way? So he said this this host of heaven, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, you shall persuade him and also prevail, go out and do so. Therefore, look, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets of yours, and the Lord has declared disaster against you. Now, while you chew through that, because that is a very strange sounding passage in the Bible, if you look at it just by itself, detached from the rest of the Word of God, but it's absolutely true and explanatory of what's going on. And isn't it fascinating that the very first time we get to see the throne of God in the Bible, all the hosts of heaven are there, and even lying spirits are there, and God is orchestrating what they're doing. Fascinating. God's prophet named Micaiah, the one you see in verse 19, was allowed to see what is happening 24-7 above us. What is happening? God is watching over his word to perform it, Jeremiah 1.12 says. God has decided that everything he promised in the Bible is going to happen, and he is going to shape the events of the world according to what he has written in this book. This is history 
recorded in advance. There's nothing like it in the world. In fact, I was just reading a, a little column that twice in the Bible, it clearly says that Damascus, you know, Damascus, Syria, is going to be completely uninhabited and destroyed and burned and melted and there'll be nothing left of it. And did you know history records that city has never been uninhabited for thousands of years? I mean, continuous, never uninhabited, ever. So that means what the Bible says is future. And isn't it interesting what's going on right now? God's already told us the city of Damascus is going to be destroyed. There's a million people that live there. Think about that. You know something that maybe a lot of them don't even know. You know, I'd move out the country if I was living in Damascus. But okay, let's get right back to 1 Kings 22. The amazing detail we learn from 1 Kings 22 is that the universe is not out of control. God is in control. He's enthroned, and even demons have to come in. They have appointments, and they show up, and he regulates, limits even what they can do. Well, right after this throne event, wicked King Ahab gets slain in battle. Just like the Bible said he would. Did you know that Ahab, do you remember what happened? He, he sinned against God because he went to an innocent guy named Naboth, and actually his wife conspired, and they accused Naboth of, of uh, you know, speaking against the Lord, so they stoned him, and so um, the king appropriated this little beautiful garden that was right next to his house that he didn't own, but he didn't, Naboth wouldn't sell it to him, so he killed him so he could get it. And the Lord said, because you did that, the Lord said, you're going you're gonna to bleed to death and dogs are going to lick up the blood from you bleeding to death. A little grisly, if you ask me. Well, so right after this story, wicked King Ahab gets slain in battle, just like God's word said he would, right down to, by the way, he was parked in his chariot. Kings used to park up on a hill and watch the battle, and the soldiers would fight and die looking up at their king. And he was up there way out of range, you know, watching the whole thing up away. And it says that some enemy took his bow and just, it says, and a man just drew a bow at venture and shot an arrow. And you know what? The Lord knew exactly where one little part of his armor was that wasn't close enough. And that arrow went right through probably the little connection where the shoulder meets the front and back and meets the helmet. And it went, and it says he bled all day long. And at nightfall, he died. And they drove his chariot back to the castle in the, in the city and buried him and left the chariot to wash it out. And the next morning when they came, the dogs were licking up the blood. See, God was watching over his word. Well, turn onward. That's kind of who wants to stay there. Let's go to Job, okay? That's a more uh, uh, well-known book. So turn from 1 Kings to the right to the book of Job. And we're going to look at the first two chapters. As we look at the book of Job, I want you to see that the whole book of Job is built around... This single concept that God on the throne wants Job in the ashes of his troubles to see them through the frame. That's how the book opens and closes. You understand that? The book of Job opens and closes around the throne. All of our life is lived from beginning to end through that lens of God sitting on the throne. As we look at Job's woes and troubles, we have to understand that the events of our lives too are carried out in front of the same scene of God's power. It isn't like the Lord just turned this thing on for Micaiah and he turns it on for Job. You understand, it's, it's, it's happening now, right now. This is going on. We're sitting, the Lord's watching you in church. I don't have to. You know, someone just sent me an email this week, and they said, you weren't interesting until 10 minutes in. I was working on my phone until then, and then I started paying attention. I thought, thanks for telling me. You know, it doesn't matter. Uh, it, the Lord watches. See, that's, we answer to him, not to each other. And so he's watching us right now. 
And from Job 1 and 2, here's what he wants us to see. Trust the one who's seated on the throne. Trust the one who's watching everything. Trust the one who's listening to everything. Trust the one who has all the hosts of heaven under his control. Trust the one who is orchestrating all the events. Trust him. Now, if, if I could do a quick synopsis of the 42 chapters of Job, it would be this. You know, if, you know how they have the big title in a book and they have the little title. The little title, you know, the big title is the book of Job. The little title is, you're all part of something that is incredibly bigger than you realize. Or I could put it this way, you're all into something that's much bigger than you think. In other words, what Job does is it says that you and I are not just merely one little life that lives, you know, six, or what are we up to, 74.7 years or however our life expectancy has gotten to be in America, and, and just works through life all by himself, and, and everything I do only matters to the people that know me, and there aren't very many of those, and everyone will forget me, and I'll be gone. No. The Lord says you're part of something much bigger than that. That every day you and I are part of God orchestrating glory to his name as he watches over his word to perform it. And we're part of the cast of the performing of the word. There is a cosmic struggle going on between the God of the universe who does not force us to do what he wants and between the God of this world who will do anything to frustrate what God is trying to stream into our lives. And the problem is a lot of the cast members aren't listening, and a lot of the cast members aren't reading the script, and a lot of the cast members aren't doing what the king left them to do. See, that's what the whole book of Job is about. The throne is set in heaven. It's been there overshadowing all of human events since creation, but God is not just sitting there and watching like a game on TV munching. You know, he's not kicked back, watching it play. But God is always depicted as actively involved. He's in the affairs of mankind. He's ruling. He's reigning. Never out of touch. Never out of control. That's huge. The Lord now shows us this scene. And, and this, was, this was broadcast by God to show us an event that took place between Noah and Abraham. That's, that's where most Bible scholars place this. Job's life is somewhere between Noah at the end of the flood and Abraham at the beginning of the nation of Israel. So somewhere in those couple hundred years, there we find Job. And so this event was broadcast for God, by God for us to see the big picture of the God we can trust, the one on the throne because he knows us and protects us, but our concept of him knowing and protecting needs to be adjusted by this frame because what he allows is not what we would want. That's why we have to trust him. See, it all connects together. And the whole book of Job ends with Job summarizing what he learned. You know what it says in Job 42, 5 and 6? He says, God, I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now I see you. And I repent in dust and ashes. Basically, Job says, I've heard all about you. By the way, he was a great guy. He was raising his family right. He was praying for him. He was sacrificing the Lord. He knew the Lord. He knew the word of the Lord. And he was a righteous man. But he says, Lord, I knew all of that kind of at an arm's length. I was acquainted with you. But going through what I just went through for 42 chapters, now I know you. And what he said is, now I can really see you. And that was the goal God had. God wanted Job to see the one on the throne was the one he could trust. Not just in a Sunday school lesson he heard it. He wanted to have him experience it. And see, that's what glorifies God. Not when we watch a, a moving presentation and hear some truth and say, ah, oh, it's neat. It's when we live that out in our daily lives and experience it. Okay, real quickly... Let's look at Job 1 and 2. And, and what I'm going to show you is the big picture, what's going on up above, and then I'm going to show you the ground picture, the lesson that's learned, okay? And so first of all, the big picture is the one seated on the throne stays in touch with our lives. So you start following along in your Bible, and I'm going to read Job 1. There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and, was sh and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Okay, look up. 
you know what that means? God knows all about Job. I mean, he knows where he lives. He knows his family. He knows all of his kids. He knows everything about him. He knows the Lord is in touch. He knows Job, everything about him. That's not all he knows. Look at verse 3. And his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household. So this man was the greatest of all his people in the East. You know what else the Lord knows? He knows all of our possessions. Isn't that interesting? He, he, he was better than the IRS. He couldn't hide anything from the Lord. He knows exactly everything that Job owned and possessed. I mean, right down to the female donkeys. I mean, I always think that's so amazing. Were there no males? You know, I mean, what's going on here? Is he prejudiced, you know, and discriminatory? But, but the Lord knew all of his possessions. And that's why we should never worry about what other people give or don't give, because it doesn't matter, because the Lord is the one that knows exactly how much we have, and whether what we give him is a proportionate reflection of his blessing or a stingy response that I need to do something, so I'm going to do something. See, that, the Lord doesn't measure the amount we give. He measures the cost, because he knows what we have and he sees what we give in proportion to how he's blessed us. But keep reading with the story. It's just amazing. And his sons, verse 4, would go out and feast in their houses each on an appointed day, and they would send and invite three sisters to eat and drink with them. And so it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them. He would rise early in the morning and offer burnt sacrificing sizes according to the number of them all. For Job said in his heart that it may be my sons have sinned and cursed God in their heart. And thus Job did regularly. Now, here's truth for us, number one. God was tracking with everything going on in in Job's life. He knew where the kids were. He knew how they related. He knew how Job parented and was a spiritual head and prayed for his family. The Lord's tracking with all this. So that's the first thing. Second thing, starting in verse 6, here's the second big picture. The one seated on the throne regulates the adversary of all God's people named Satan. In fact, Satan is the Hebrew word for adversary. So Satan is the adversary. And God regulates him. Look at his regulation, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Whoa. And Satan also came up among them. Now here is a fascinating verse. This is, this is again, the Bible calls angels the sons of God. They were singing at creation. Here again, This is not people. This is angelic creatures are coming to present themselves before the throne of God. You know what that means? That means there's appointments up there. And it means that that things are regulated. And and it's just not, you know, it's like this. And guess who has access? Demons and Satan. See, they're not just off on their own, doing their own thing, just whatever they want. God is regulating Satan in his activities. In fact, if we ever get to Revelation 12, do you know what it says there? You know, there's the progressive revelation of the Bible that that sometimes God just tells us a little bit and he just keeps adding to it all the way through the Bible. Do you know what it says in Revelation 12 about Satan? It says Satan is the one who is the accuser of the saints. Satan doesn't just stand up there leaning on the throne, you know, watching everything. He is accusing. In fact, his name means slander. Do you know what diabolus, the, the devil, devil means slanderer. He is a slanderous accuser. That's why gossip is so bad. Whenever people gossip and accuse and slander, they are using the Greek word for the devil. They are, that's what deviled tongues are, slanderers. They're just like the devil. That's why the Lord says in Titus, remember we covered it, don't do that. Don't be like Satan. So he's up there. And the Lord said to Satan, verse 7, where do you come? So Satan answered and said, from going to and fro throughout the earth and walking back and forth on it. Now look up for a minute. Peter talks about that, doesn't he? He says, for your adversary, Satan, the devil, the accuser, is like a what? Roaring lion. And he's prowling around seeking whom he may devour. See, there's such congruence to the Bible. It all fits together. Uh, and, and so here we see that picture. And verse 8, And then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless, an upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? 
Here's a truth for us. This is a hard one. God prompted the devil's attack on Job. Satan didn't bring up Job. Who brought Job up? Who made him a target? God. He says, hey, prowler. Hey, roaring lion. Hey, accuser. Have you checked that one out? Why? Why? Sitting in the grandstands here, we'd go, that doesn't... You know, most people have, have trouble with that. They almost think that there's an Old Testament God, you know, this, this Canaanite exterminator. I mean, he just goes out and exterminates Canaanites. And, and, and he kills all the firstborn children in Egypt. And, and he drowns whole armies. And, and he incinerates. And so that's the Old Testament God. Liberalism, mainline denominations, follow this. You know, that's the Old Testament God, but in the New Testament. We have Jesus, and he wouldn't hurt a fly. And his heavenly father is watching the sparrows and the lilies. It's kind of like Colonel Sanders, you know? He just, oh, oh but in Revelation, we get back to that one. <sighs> stay away from Revelation and oh, the Old Testament and just stay with Jesus, you know? And, that, and so we've, that's around us. And so people are shy of Revelation, and they can't understand how the kind you know, Jesus could possibly incinerate Canaanites, you know, and so we just comfortably leave everything alone. You just don't mess with it. But see, what's so interesting is if, if you understand the throne, all of a sudden you get a frame around all this and everything fits inside. So what, what is going on here? Well, well, look at verse 9. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him and all his household and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. Basically what he's saying is two things I hope that you really hold on to. Number one is anything good in our life, every good and perfect thing comes from God and any blessing in our life is from him. Secondly, we are completely sealed and kept from any demonic intrusion into our life by the power of God. Now Paul tells us in Ephesians that there are things we can do that unlocks the door to the devil. There's a whole list of them. And, and it, it leaves room for the devil in our life to attack and to, to do bad things. But if we are yielded to him and making choices obediently in step with the Spirit, we're really hedged. It's wonderful. But, but keep reading. So what the devil says in verse 11 is, so stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and surely he'll curse you to your face. In other words, he's saying he's only liking you because you're giving him stuff. And the Lord said to him, behold, instead of me doing it, behold, all that he has is in your power. Only don't lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. This is amazing. This is an amazing event. Here's the truth. Satan wants to make God's servants dishonor their king on the throne. Do you understand? All of life is lived, even now, with us. At work, at school, at home, on the road. All of life is playing out with Satan and his minions wanting to get us to dishonor the king on the throne. Do you remember what happened with David and Bathsheba? David should have gone to war, but he didn't. He was looking over the railing at his neighbor's wife taking a bath. And you know the whole event. Do you know the end of the event? Well, do you remember what the prophet Nathan said? He says, you have caused the enemies of the Lord to rejoice. The hosts of heaven were gathered. God is watching and he's pouring out his grace, and he's sending person after person to David, saying, David, that's not your wife. David, are you sure you should be doing this? David, you shouldn't invite her over here to the castle. David, you should be on the warfare. You should not be peeking at her in her bath time. God sent all those warnings to David, and David chose to not obey. See, there's, the whole Bible is filled with God does not force us to do what he wants. David chose to disobey. And you know what Nathan said? As the hosts of heaven were watching from the throne, guess who's over here going, <laughs> ha, 
rejoicing. You've caused the enemies of the Lord to rejoice because you've sinned. That's Satan's purpose. But let's go back to verse 13. Here's the big picture again. The one seated on the throne allowed Job to lose his property and children. Not as a judgment, not as a penalty, not as God saying he shouldn't be rich. The big picture is God allowed Job to lose everything. Starting in verse 13, there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and a messenger came and, and said to Job, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding, and the Sabaeans raided them and took them all away, and they killed your servants, and I alone escaped. Here's a little truth. Satan can incite what we would call terrorists. The Sabaeans, Satan didn't do this, the Sabaeans did it. Why did they do it? Satan prompted them to do it. There is a lot, remember Satan came to kill and steal and destroy. Do you think all the wicked dictators and murderous people throughout history thought of all that themselves? Satan incites killing, stealing, destroying. And then verse 16, while they were still speaking, another came and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep. You know what? Satan can send fire from the sky. How do we know that? He did it right here. How do we know it's really, really? Because he's going to do it again in Revelation. One of the ways the Antichrist rules the world is he's going to have a false prophet that can call down fire by asking Satan to send down fire from heaven on his command. That is amazing to think about the spiritual realm like that. Verse 17, while they're still speaking, another came, and you know that, that he said, by verse 19, a great wind came from across the wilderness, struck the four corners of the house, it fell on young people, and they're dead. Did you know what this says? Satan can send horribly destructive weather, and that sounds like a tornado. Just... You understand that? He's the prince of the power of the air. He's the god of this world. He has incredible powers over the people to incite evil. He has great power over nature. He's the one that tried to drown Jesus in the boat. I mean, you talk about flagrant attacks. Here's the creator himself in a boat, and Satan tries to send a storm and swamp the boat and drown Jesus. If Satan will try to drown Jesus, can you imagine what he might try and do to us? You understand? He has great power. Okay, verse 20. Here's another big picture. The one seated on the throne is listening to the cries of our heart through all this stuff. And, and so Job arose, tore his robe. I mean, he didn't just sit there and say, hmm, this is interesting. He, he got involved. He arose. He tore his robe. He shaved his head. He fell on the ground. And he worshiped. And he said, naked came I from my mother's womb. Naked shall I return there. The Lord gave. The Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Verse 22, and all this... Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Here's a lesson. God was magnified through Job's cries, through his... I mean, Job didn't say, this feels great, oh, I love it. No, he wept, he cried, he moaned. But, God, but he chose to not sin against the Lord. You understand? The devil wants to incite us to not listen to not watch, to not see life the right way, to not obey, to not sync our lives with the Lord so that, so that he can dishonor through us the Lord. It's called grieving the Lord. It's called disobeying him. It dishonors him. Keep going. Next big picture. Look at chapter 2. The one seated on the throne allowed Job to suffer intensely bad times. I don't want to read all this. Go down to verse 7. Job went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils. So Satan comes, strikes Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Wow. Here's a little on-the-ground truth from that. Bad things can happen to good people in order for them to glorify the Lord. That's what Job's all about. Bad things happen to a good fellow. God starts out saying he's blameless, upright, fears the Lord, and follows me. So none of that awful stuff happened because he was bad, disobedient, rebellious, out of step with the Lord. All that happened so God would be glorified. Can you see, if you don't understand that, you really have a problem. You say, what are you doing, Lord? What are you doing, Lord? But if you have that perspective that 
The one on the throne can be trusted. Now, here, let's end by going to Matthew. And this is where we're going to pick up next time. But I want to show you something because Jesus connects the Old and the New Testament gods and says they're the same. And that the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. And the God of the New Testament is my Father. And he is on the throne in heaven, chapter 5, verse 16. And Jesus is the one in chapter 6, verse 9, that says the only way you can make it through life is by following this simple little pattern. In fact, I, I told you last summer, um, I spoke on this in, in July, I think, about the Lord's Prayer. And I said, this is what Jesus said should constitute not the words, but the framework of every communication with God. Did you catch what the framework is? If you look down, look at verse 9 of, of Matthew chapter 6. In this manner, therefore, pray. As clearly as Jesus could tell us. It's clear and simple. We just need to learn to do what he asks us to do and follow the pattern. Here it is, verse 9. Our Father who art in heaven, you who sit on the throne with the hosts of heaven arrayed before you, you who see clearly everything going on, you who, who hear everything, feel everything, notice everything, you who are enthroned in heaven as the majesty on high. That's who I just placed my call through to. So we start with that. You know, sometimes we right through the opening. There's supposed to be a little pause there. Who we're talking to. You know, I learned this when we were in Honduras. Do you know, in, in Honduras, you don't, don't just say hi and walk by. You must talk to everybody you see. Or you say adios. If you want to walk by them, you don't say hola. You say adios. That means I'm not stopping to talk. In America, we just say, hey, hi, how you doing? And we move right on. In prayer, we've gotten in that habit. Father, we don't pause and, and realize towering over us is his throne, his greatness. He's ruling over all. Hearing, he knows everything going on. Hallowed be thy name. All those antiphonal chants and all that stuff. God's saying, get in tune. I'm holy, holy, holy. Well, that's arresting to us. And then look at the next part, verse 10. Your kingdom come. I'm inviting you to rule my life. We almost don't need to pray beyond that. See where he is, what he's doing, he's in touch. Realize how holy he is. And say, hey, I'm not. Can you just run everything for me? Rule my life. Your kingdom come. You help me with all of the events, the, the choices of my life. Thy will be done. And then look how it ends in verse, at the very end, verse 13. Uh, Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Whew. All those lying spirits. The devil that can do all, smite bodies. Satan can bring horrific diseases to people. Satan can bring horrific, deadly weather. Satan can, can incite people to pillage and plunder. Do you see why the Lord said, deliver us from the evil one? We should be saying, oh Lord, you're the only one that can protect me, hedge me from this evil one. And I just, I'm not going to be afraid. I'm just going to trust you're going to keep me safe. And then look how it ends. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. We're asking and seeking for the God of the throne to increase in our lives. Did, did you catch yours? Your kingdom is what's important. Your power is important. You being glorified is important. Do you know what New York Times said? That unchristian publication, do you know what they said? I love to read it. I want to hear what the world thinks. You know what they said? They said, we live in a culture where bragging has become mainstream. Social media is people constantly saying, for mine is the glory, and I want to show you everything instead of thine is the glory. And I want to focus my life not on showing everybody how great I am, but showing everybody how great God is. That's why Jesus said, every time you pray, invite God's rule more and more. You're on the throne I'm your servant. I want to do what you want me to do. That's the orientation God wants us to have in life. Let's stand together for a word of prayer. As you stand, two things I'd like to share with you, two and a half. Um,
The first one is that there are always uh, godly men and women that are here to pray with you at the end of the service. Maybe you just need to reconnect with the Lord. Maybe you just need to say, could you help me see what's horrible in my life through that frame? Pray with me. So that's the first thing. They'll be here at the end. The invitation is always open. The second is that we always have a visitor reception after this service right across in the Welcome Center. And um, I'll talk to as many until my nose runs and my voice runs out. So, uh, you know, uh, I'll try and get through that. But here's the second thing. Tonight is the most unusual time. In Revelation 4, it says that God's throne is surrounded by all this worship and if you read the content of the worship, it is, it is all the redeemed talking about how great salvation is. Do you know that the closest we get to being around the throne of God is when we gather for the celebration of communion, where we each individually thank him for redeeming us. And we do that twice a month. We actually come to a throne room setting, and we join everybody around the throne saying, Thank you for, and tonight we're going to talk about thank you for your work of salvation in my life, and we're going to talk about the doctrine of salvation. So think about the privilege that God invited us to come around the throne and join in all that worship. And he does it because at communion, the one that sits on the throne invites us to a meal where he's on one side and we're on the other. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for telling us how to orient our lives so that it makes sense. Help us to use the communications device of your voice through your word to grow in our understanding so that your will is done and so that yours is the glory that comes from our life. We ask that in the name of Jesus. And all of God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go.